Hi, this is Vinny Santana, traveling coach at Iron Guides. In this video, I'm gonna react to Christian Blumenfeld gold medal at the Tokyo Olympic Games. Christian shared his power profile on Strava, and also I'm gonna discuss a little bit of the strategies and the equipment that he used to get that gold medal. I'll start with Christian equipments first, and then we go through a little bit of his race day strategy and also the power details. To start with, Pay attention on his tri suit. You can almost well. It's it's very see through. You can you can see pretty much everything. And he's using even like a bit of like a, some black speedo here underneath. He has the heart rate chest. And why is that? If you follow Christian on social media, I'm gonna leave um, the link here down below. You're gonna see that he was testing along with his sponsors what's the best fabric for the conditions in Tokyo. They're expecting an extremely hot day in Tokyo, about 35 degrees Celsius. So based on that, they designed a special tri suit and also they made certain decisions that I'm gonna talk about today in this video. So that's a key component for the race. Moving on to the swim, none of those guys are Christian, but I thought it would be interesting to, to share this with you. Have a, have a look how none of those three athletes, they have the race swim cap. And as a triathlete, you're supposed to swim with the race swim cap, the organizers give it to you. But when the, the water is too warm or the day it's, or it's too hot outside, it's very normal for the athletes to, on purpose, lose the swim cap. So how they do this? On the start line, they may not put the swim cap fully, maybe just a little bit on the top of the head. So once they jump into the water, they may lose that swim cap a little bit easier. Or even during the swim, they may just rip the swim cap out of the head as well. So you can see clearly because it helps with the cooling effect. It helps them to feel better. The, the water temperature in Tokyo was, was extremely high. So a lot of the athletes, they opt for this strategy to keep like a lower um, body temperature. So this is uh, Christian's bike. The first thing that I can I can point out here is, is the saddle geometry. Have a look on how his saddle it's moved all the way, it's pushed all the way to the front, both within the seat post and also within the rail. So Christian, it's a he does half Ironman. He actually holds the world record at the time of this video for the half Ironman distance. So he used to ride in the time trial position. And he went into the race also with the backup op option to have to go into the wind, to pull the pack, to make a break. So he was ready to do a lot of the work into the wind. So for that reason, he rides on a, on a more aggressive position rather than a more... His seat is pretty much right in the front. So this way, it's very similar to a time trial uh, position angle. For the race wheels, he also opted for something that we can see that he had the, the idea that it wouldn't be a problem for him if he had to go to the front, if he had to spend a lot of the time pushing to the wind. He opted for like a deeper uh, heel wheel here. So he's running a 42 in the front and a 65 in the back. So even though there's a bit of like a weight penalty here, it may, he, he can make up with the aerodynamic gains. Disc brakes, most, actually all of the bikes in the Olympics that I saw that I was watching the race, I didn't see any bikes that had a rim brake. In this type of course, it was very technical, a lot of U-turns, a lot of very sharp turns. In this situation, the disc brake, despite being a little bit heavier, it's worth because of the, of the, the better braking that these athletes get. Um, another op op interesting observation here is the two water bottles that he has. I would imagine that one of the bottles he's taking his calories and the other bottle he's bringing just plain water but that's just what I'm guessing and also he's using like a bit of like a prototype of this aero bar I've never seen this before I believe it's pretty new because actually they are hiding it on social media in leading into the games both himself and his um, teammates so they like blur the photo of the aero bars so it's a pretty cool um, aerodynamic aero bar it's not too long because for ITU racing, when it's a legal uh, drafting legal race, there are certain rules they have to follow. So the aero bar, it cannot go past the shifters, the line of the shifters, and it cannot, it cannot go past, I believe it's 13 centimeters of the skewer. Talking about um, calories and gels, this is, um, once again, those, this is not Christian, but I thought it would be interesting to share. Two of the best athletes in the world, um, Vincent Louis from France, 
he was one of the pre-race pre favorites. And both himself and Iron Royal from Australia, they're carrying a gel stuck into the tri suits. And you can also see on the top of the top tube of the bikes, they both carry more gels there. So that's just another proof that those guys, they do need to take calories during a race, during the Olympic distance. In this situation here, we have um, two and then two. So that's at least 200 calories. And then on the screen here, also on the run, this, uh, this is the first pack on the run. Uh, the French guy, Konix, he's holding a gel flask. So that's um, another way to stay, uh, to stay filled during the, during the race. It's not that normal for them to have a gel on the run. It's a little bit too intense. But these athletes opted for that option as well. Most of them, they will probably have a gel towards the end of the bike. Also because it takes a little bit of a while until the gel kicks in. So if you, if you wait until it's too late into the run, by the time that's kicking in, you're almost pretty much finishing the race. But it's also an example of what those guys are doing during the Olympic distance. It's not only you as an age group that you have to be careful with those things. The next stop that I wanted to discuss, it's in... in it, the helmet that Christian wore and also why himself and all in this photo here you can clearly see that's the main pack all those athletes except actually Christian teammate they are using um, road helmets with um, big vents so a lot of like big holes there for better airflow keep the heads cool which it did not happen in the London Olympics this is a photo from the, the Browns they were first and third respectively in, in that race. So here they have an aero helmet also because in London, the temperature was a lot cooler than in Tokyo. So in Tokyo, those athletes, the priority was to stay cool. They were expecting a lot of heat. And also in the Olympics in Rio, it was the same similar equipment choice they were expecting. And it was a quite a bit of like a hot day. So they opted for the vented, vented helmets. So the next, uh, the next topic, it's when it comes to transition. This is quite an interesting photo. You can probably see this like yellow uh, rubber band on Christian's helmet here. I believe, I'm not quite sure I didn't see it, but because he has his sunglasses on, I believe it's a bit of like a system that he created to speed transitions up. So the, all those guys, you can see the blurred athletes in the background, they keep the sunglasses stuck into the helmet and then during the bike, when they have a bit of like an opportunity, they put the sunglasses on. While Christian, what I imagine that he did as he was pushing the bike with the right hand and with the left hand, he was uh, putting his sunglasses on and the rubber band is probably just to keep it in place to avoid that it's going to like um, fall off. The next photo here, we have his teammate Gustav Eden, who was the world champion for the Ironman 7.3 distance in 2019 and very similar but look on the top of his bars his bars you can see the he's carrying the sunglasses here it's a one of those like clear sunglasses i imagine because uh, those guys are usually sponsored by sunglasses company so they probably got to fulfill their contract and race with some sort of the the sunglasses that the company provides but the other athletes here it's the most common traditional way to have a fast transition and to keep the sunglasses within your helmet and then you put it on the fly. But Gustav and a few others that I was able to identify as well, they just take the sunglasses on the bars and then during the ride when they see an opportunity, when the pace is not too hot, they put the sunglasses on. On this next slide, uh, it's the only one that I was able to find Christian's running shoe. So, so he is using the ASICS Meta Speed, of course, with that carbon plate. All those professional athletes, you know, at that level, it's a pretty obvious choice. It does help, but it only helps after certain speed. S subscribe to the channel here. It's something that I want to talk about as well. I've had like a few athletes who, when they shift to the carbon plate shoes, they were struggling a little bit with Achilles, with, with calf pain. So you got to be really careful if, you, if you're going to use one of them. And it only really helps once you're running around or below four minute pace. So if you're like a beginner triathlete, it may not be the best shoe for you because it's not going to help and it may add a little bit of too much stress. And they're not cheap and they also usually don't last too long. So for, and this is the finish line. Uh, well, going back to the, to the shoot, uh, 
so Christian, of course, is not racing with a watch at that type of level. Uh, one, there is no need for the watch because they're racing the man, not the course. And also, there's all the negative side effects of, of racing with a watch in the swim. You're like getting distracted, even probably creates a little bit of a drag when it comes to this level every half a second counts. So, no watch. But, however, he has the heart rate monitor belt on his chest, as you can see. So, this, I believe, it was just to collect a little bit of data on the bike and then with his coach after the race, they'll probably have a look, see what happened with, on the bike, you know, how was his response, his heart rate, the power, we're going to talk about the power here later. And I wouldn't be surprised actually, I don't know in fact, but I wouldn't be surprised if <clears throat> Christian or some of the Olympic athletes, they do race with the data on the bike, but some of them even take the screen off the Garmin of the, the receiver. So they don't have access to, to the data during the race. Otherwise, it may affect a little bit the mindset if they're racing because they may see numbers that's probably a little bit too high. So they're thinking, oh man, this is too strong. This is too intense for me where they should be fully present into the race and not worrying about what the Garmin is telling them. But anyways, he did race with the heart rate monitor and I thought that was an interesting uh, two, I'm sure it's for post-race analysis. So now moving to Christian Strava account. I'm gonna also put on the link here uh, in the description of this video of the Tokyo um, bike course that he uploaded on Strava. So to start with Christian, Christian is 178 or so and he weighs 75 kilos. This is the official stats. I don't believe in it. I found this on the internet, but I've seen him personally. And he's about my height, so I'm 179, so we're about the same. But he, he is lighter than 75 kilos. However, since it's the official stats, I'm gonna go with it. And his power to weight ratio, it comes to 5.46. His FTP is at 410. I believe it's a little bit high. It's maybe the, the power to weight, sorry. It's, uh, it's in the high fives because he's probably like on, on the very low 70s or even maybe high 60 kilos. He, he looks a little bit bigger than the other guys, but some of those guys he was racing, they don't weigh even 60 kilos. So if he's like high 60s, you know, you're gonna look a lot bigger than the others. But looking into the, into the data here on Strava, so the average speed was 42.3 Ks an hour. The average cadence, 88. So they, those guys doing short course, they need to maintain a higher cadence. And when is the average cadence, it doesn't even include the U-turns, right? When they're, they're just coasting the bike you have a much faster reaction if you're spinning faster, if you need to go for attack or if you need to counterattack um, someone. The peak power was 987 watts in a total time of 56 minutes and 41 for the 40K. So now we, we, we can have a look at what happened to his power during the race. So this is the thing, in a race like this, I'm not sure if you did watch the the, the race live, but there were eight laps of 5k and then for the first three laps because there there was like a breakaway that happened during the swim so there was the first pack out of the water I believe nine or ten guys and then they had a bit of a gap on the main pack so during those first three laps both groups they go extremely hard to try to either the front group they try to maintain or open a bigger gap and then the, the back group, the main, the chasing pack, they try to bridge the gap because those guys, they don't want to have a group that big in the front. There are some really decent athletes there, including Johnny Brownlee. So guys like Christian, you know, he made sure that he would ride really strong, really hard for the first three laps. So that's why on the power chart here, you can see it starts really high and, and the peak was, I think, uh, the peak power was in the 3K mark. So in the first loop, one of the very sharp U-turns and then it gradually goes down a little bit. Another interesting thing that happens, the final lap, not necessarily it happened on this race here, because Christian was probably uh, already close, very close to the front, but most of the other athletes, they start to speed up a little bit because they're already thinking about transition num number two. They all try to get closer to the front of the, of the pack because 
every second counts on the run. If they're at the back of the peloton, there's, I don't know, like 20 or 30 guys, they may have a bit of a traffic. You know, some people in front of you may screw up with transition a little bit, get on the way. So you, if you lose five seconds, that's a bit of like a long way to catch if you're in an Olympic Games. And those guys are all running extremely fast. And there is such a thing also as making the pack on the run. Of course, it doesn't help as much in terms of aerodynamic, but you have that mental comfort of being like, I'm in the leading pack, I'm running, I'm in the race rather than like I'm chasing the leading guys. So that's why it's quite often as well that you may see um, a much, a, a bit of like a, a spike. And um, talking about a little bit more about strategy and, you know, the final laps and that kind of thing. On this screen, we can see the guy on the far left here, the Canadian, um, I believe, his first name, I believe, is Matthew Sharp. And right behind him is Tyler Misashuk. Very difficult name to, to pronounce, by the way. So Tyler, who won the test event in Tokyo the year before the Olympics or the, the year before, the year before, right, in 2019. And he's one of the fastest runners in the sport. So in this situation, um, Sharp went there only to work for Tyler. He did. He actually he finished last. He ran 10k in 40 minutes. I believe that some of you can probably run faster than that. But how does this work, and why they do this type of stuff? Not all athletes in, in here. It was only clear that Canada had a bit of like a domestic in the race. Casper uh, Storms for Norway. He had the aero helmet here. He's an extremely strong rider. I wouldn't be surprised if he was kind of in no man's land. He did have an amazing race. I think he was 11th place overall. But because he's one of the strongest riders in the peloton, he was also maybe ready to go and bridge the gap to help uh, Gustav Eden and Christian. But in this situation, how does it work? If you have a teammate and the, your teammate sets a really fast tempo for the peloton, no one's gonna try to break away because it's already too fast. If someone comes in attack, they'll have to go extremely intense and it's too easy. If you're riding at almost 50 k's an hour, you know how fast can someone go? Maybe low 50, so it's too easy for the whole pack to, to, to counter attack and not that athlete uh, get away. So that's why they use uh, a domestic in a race like this and also in races like the Tour de France. You always see, you know, the yellow, the yellow jersey with the team setting the pace. Otherwise, it makes it too, too difficult for, for anyone else. To, to launch an attack. So this is today's videos. I wanna hear what you think about this format, if I should do this more often. Also, if you watch the Olympics, if you have anything that you wanna share, just please leave here on the comments below. Until next time and enjoy your training.